Sounds good. Thanks, Doug. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Sorry about the slight delay. Welcome in. Welcome uh, into those folks joining us on Zoom and those folks joining us live here in For Space. We have two guests from the Office of Sustainability here with us today, uh, Jessica Krejcik and uh, Cassandra Lamontagne. So welcome to you both. I'll pass it over to you in just a second, but I just wanted to say an official world, word of welcome on behalf of Force Space for this lunch and learn feedback ses session on sustainable transport at Concordia. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with us, welcome in, drop in. We're open 10 to six, Monday to Friday. Uh, we are located in downtown Jojage, Montreal on unceded indigenous land. And effectively we operate as the front door to the university. Essentially, we collaborate with all of our community, faculty members, staff members, students, to make Concordia research initiatives and course activities publicly accessible through any number of interactive uh, events, such as today's. Today, you're going to participate in some polls, there's going to be some breakout rooms, and it's a real um, working session, which is why it's set up as a meeting. So if you're comfortable with it, we do invite you to turn your cameras on so that we can see you and you can participate with the other folks here with you. Um, I will remind you that the um, chat is open for you, of course, to put feedback into throughout and any questions that you may have. But of course, it's a meeting, so you're always welcome to just lift a hand virtual or real and unmute yourself to speak. But to tell you more about today's event and to contextualize what's going to happen in the next hour and a half, I'll pass it over to Cassandra. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, I'll just begin uh, sharing my screen here as well. There you are. Uh, great. So thank you all so much for being here. And I see a few are still trickling in, which is great. Uh, we're happy to have you and it's a lunch and learn. So Anna mentioned you can go uh, on camera if you like, which we encourage you to do. Even if you're eating your lunch, that's okay. It'll encourage a, a sense of community as though we're actually all in the same space. Um, so we welcome you to the session on sustainable transport at Concordia. Uh, my name is Cassandra Lamontang and I'm the sustainability coordinator in the Office of Sustainability. And this event is organized by our office in uh, collaboration with Force Space. Before we move on, we'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on the lands and waters of the Ginyangahaga Nation. And we recognize the Ginyangahaga as the custodians of Jajauge or Montreal and its resources. And that Jajauge today is home to diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. And as we speak today about the ways in which we get on and off and across this island of Jajauge, to get to our place of work and study. You probably don't see it, but there's um, like a major cycling <laughs> event happening outside, I'm sorry. Um, so as we think about how we get on and off and across this island, um, we can continue and, and respect the continued connections with our past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with these diverse peoples. And so we'll discuss our intention to move more sustainably. And at the same time, we can reflect on a desire to lighten our load on this land and its resources and to take on more practices that remind us of the responsible stewardship that the Ikenyungahaga have demonstrated and continue to demonstrate on their land. So today we are joined by Jessica Krejcik, our sustainability analyst in the Office of Sustainability, and she'll be taking you through our sustainable transport services and the results of our commuter habits survey. So really what you, the community, told us that you do to get to and from campus. And then we're going to introduce the Fly Less movement and the Flying Less campaign at Concordia. Today we welcome Sebastien Cacar, Associate Professor and Graduate Program Director in Concordia's Department of Geography, Planning and Environment as well as the co-director of the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling. Sebastien actually co-led the development of the Flying List Policy and Pledge in the Department of Geography. And we're fortunate to be joined by Joseph Nevins, a professor of geography at Vassar College in New York State, who has for years been a key contributor to the campaign to reduce the carbon footprint of academia. So after a quick introduction or uh, an, a sufficient introduction to the Fly Less movement. There'll be a brief Q&A with Sebastian with Joseph. So please, as they're talking, uh, put your questions into the chat as they present and we can turn to them during the Q&A period. 
And then finally, uh, in part three, which will begin in, at around 1 p.m., we'll have a few exercises for you to give your feedback about Concordia's support for uh, sustainable transport and the services related to sustainable transport and your ideas for how they could be improved. And this exercise actually ties into Concordia's campus master planning process, which serves to articulate Concordia's vision of space in terms of urban planning in the longer term. This event is also part of a series of events called Sustainable Transport Month, uh, where we offer free events, challenges, and giveaways in relation to sustainable transport. So I will be putting that link in the chat in just a moment, and we encourage you to uh, check out the ones that are still around and that you can still participate in for the remainder of September. And a reminder that we'll be selecting a month-long Vixie Pass winner from among today's participants. Um, and we will get in touch and announce that winner later on by email. So now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jess uh, for an overview of our sustainable transport services and of our commuter habits. And if you have any questions for her as we go along, like Anna said, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat and we'll make sure to answer them. So over to you. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, so to get us started, we're going to conduct a quick poll to see how you, our participants, get to campus. Uh, so what modes of transportation are you using? You can select um, all that apply. And if you're currently working from home, um, you can just imagine how, if you were required to get to campus, um, what modes you would use. So we'll just take a few seconds for that. So I believe people can see the results of the poll right now. 67% uh, of the participants put public transit. So that one is the most popular. And then we also have walking at 50% and biking at 17 and um, single car also at 17. So uh, next slide. In this first section of the presentation, we'll be discussing services related to cycling, the Concordia shuttle, public transit, car and pedestrian at Concordia. So for cycling, there are 264 bike parking spaces at the Loyola campus, 32 of which are covered. The downtown campus has 576 outdoor parking spaces, 97 of which are covered. And uh, the downtown campus also has the indoor secure bike parking facility, um, which has the capacity for 70 bikes. Um, bicycles. And so in total, the two campuses can accommodate for 840 bike parking spaces. Um, every year, facilities management removes abandoned bikes from the bike racks to make way for active cyclists to park. Confiscated bikes are held by security for three month storage period, after which they're donated to an organization that recycles and refurbishes them. Dixie Montreal is a nonprofit organization created in 2014 by the city of Montreal to manage its bike sharing program. Uh, the Dixie network has over 9,000 bikes and 700 stations spread out across the island of Montreal and also in its suburbs. Um, Dixie has both regular and electric bikes available, and there are currently six Dixie stations on and near the downtown campus and two at Loyola. The Bixie station on the corner of Mezenev and um, Mackay, which is very close by, is actually the most used station on the entire uh, Bixie network um, with over 500 users a day. Uh, Bixie currently offers 10% discount for Concordia students, staff, and faculty on their monthly membership. At Concordia, there are also two biking cooperatives on campus that offer bike repair and maintenance services. Uh, there's Le Petit Vélo Rouge that's at um, the Loyola campus and also the right to move at the downtown campus. Concordia uh, was certified silver for Vélo Québec's uh, Vélo Sympathique program in 2019. And this is a certification process that recognizes institutions that uh, promote, incentivize, and invest in infrastructure to support the cycling community. And right now, Concordia's goal is to become gold certified in 2025. Uh, 25. 
So for the Concordia shuttle bus, um, it travels between the two campuses and is free for students, faculty and staff. The shuttle schedule is from Monday to Friday from 7.30 to 11 p.m. and runs every 15 to 20 minutes. The shuttle bus uses B20 biodiesel, which is a blend of six to 20% biodiesel, which is made up of renewable plant resources um, instead of fossil fuels. Uh, for public transportation, both campuses have um, several public transit services in close proximity. The Loyola campus has three bus lines that bring students to the closest metro stations and also um, the Montreal West train station, which is walking distance from the campus. The downtown campus is in proximity to numerous bus routes and located adjacent to the Guy Concordia metro station. It is also walking distance from the Lucien Lavier train station and for full-time Concordia students, there's a 40% reduction, uh, reduced fare public transit pass. For cars, the Loyola campus has approximately 380 car parking spaces. The cost of a parking permit for students at Loyola is $230 a semester. And uh, for faculty and staff, it's 95 to $115 a month. Uh, permit parking spaces are limited and the cost of the carpool, carpool parking permit is $70 a month. And the number of electric vehicle charging, charging stations uh, on the Loyola campus is two. For the downtown campus, approximately 706 parking spaces are available. The cost of an average parking permit for staff and faculty is approximately $230 a month and the cost of a carpool parking permit is $200 a month. And there are two electric uh, vehicle char charging stations on the downtown campus. And on top of these charging stations, there are also several charging stations available through the electric circuit network. And um, there are many close to downtown and only about one or two in proximity to the Loyola campus. If you are a pedestrian, uh, you can take advantage of the underground tunnels, which connect um, the Guy Concordia metro station to the MB, EV, GM, LB, and the hall buildings. And so this allows for faster connectivity and also shelter in the winter. Uh, side, wide sidewalks can be found around campus buildings in addition to uh, pedestrian crosswalks and lights at the intersections. So looking at um, the commuter habits survey, um, in September 2019, a voluntary survey was launched as part of a joint effort between the Office of Institutional Planning and Analysis and the Office of Sustainability at Concordia. A representative sample of students, faculty, and staff were invited to participate by email. Of the overall sample, 1,718 responded, uh, respondents completed the survey, generating a response rate of approximately 11%. So the commuter habits survey was designed to address the following primary research questions. Uh, what are the Concordia community's commuter habits? What are the commuter preferences in the Concordia community and what influences them to adopt or avoid certain transportation methods, uh, modes? Um, what are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with respondents trips from home to their primary Concordia campus? And from this research question, um, we use this information to extrapolate the greenhouse gas footprint from commuting for our entire uh, community. So looking at the results, um, the average travel time in minutes for the Concordia community ranges from 25 minutes to 38 minutes, the longest average travel time being for the Loyola students. The average distance traveled in kilometers for the Concordia community ranges from 11 point uh, three kilometers to 13.4 kilometers, and approximately 50% of Concordians commute five days a week, and 20% are commuting four days a week. Um, so looking at the modal share for spring and fall, respondents were asked to indicate their primary mode of transportation in the spring and fall used to commute to their primary Concordia campus. Uh, so this table really reflects these primary modes of transportation only. Uh, for the Loyola campus, staff and faculty use active modes of transportation almost twice as much as students. Conversely, students use collective modes of transportation twice as much as faculty and staff. And 30%, uh, 36% of staff and faculty use motorized vehicles to commute. For the downtown campus, the modal share does not vary as drastically between students and faculty and staff as for the Loyola campus. Um, the majority of students, faculty and staff use collective modes of transportation for their commute. 
the highest percentage of single occupancy vehicle use for commuting is by the Loyola staff and faculty at 34%. Uh, staff and faculty at the downtown campus have the highest percentage of people commuting by bicycle at 12%. Uh, it's also important to note that seasonally, there's a significant shift in commuter habits between summer, spring, fall, and the winter months. So public transportation increases in the winter months compared to the spring and fall. Um, automobile use remains approximately the same throughout the year, uh, but active transportation um, decreases substantially in the winter. So um, we have a second poll for you to complete. Before we reveal the reasons behind our community's travel choices, we want to hear from you. So what factors would increase the likelihood of increasing your use of active and uh, collective modes of transportation to commute to campus? So you can um, select all that apply. Some people take a 15 person bike like we saw pass by the fourth space just moments ago. <laughs> Don't see anyone voting. Is it working properly? Okay, there's one, there's a couple. There's no answer if we're already using biking or walking. So if we don't need any improvement, there's no option for that answer. True. That's true. So of the two people that responded, both responded that having free or highly affordable access to showers, lockers, and changing rooms um, would be uh, a, a, an important factor, and also more frequent buses. To Sebastian's, to Sebastian's point, uh, I mean, as a collective and active transit user already, I, I mean, I'm not the uh, target audience, I suppose, for changes, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, so looking at the factors influencing the people who had uh, responded to the commuter habit survey uh, for modes of active transportation, of the students who walk and run to campus, 9% indicated that not owning a car was a factor in their choice to do so, whereas only 2% of staff and faculty indicated the same. Staff and faculty indicated a greater interest in bicycling for personal enjoyment and exercise. Um, than students who instead indicated reduced travel time and environmental concerns as the most important factors for bicycling. Among commuters to the Loyola campus, the most important factor that would increase cycling to campus would be the availability of safer uh, bicycle paths and networks. Uh, for the downtown campus, it would be the availability of a bicycle repair and safety workshop. The most po popular factor that would increase walking to campus would be the availability of free or discounted access to showers, lockers, or changing rooms. Uh, looking at factors that influence modes of collective transportation, uh, Concordia students and staff and faculty who use the shuttle bus indicated that more frequent and less crowded buses would be the top two most important factors for increasing the number and frequency of trips to campus by the shuttle bus. Respondents were, most, uh, were mostly concerned with commute times as well as the reliability and frequency of service along existing public transit routes. There was also a notable interest in discounted transit passes for faculty and staff at Concordia. It is the most important factor for staff and faculty to increase the number and frequency of trips they make to Concordia by public transport. Uh, looking at the factors that influence um, vehicle transportation, most single use vehicle users in the survey indicated that they drive to campus because of the flexible departure and arrival times, also because it's the fastest option. Staff and faculty indicated that having multiple destinations before, during, or after their commute to Concordia influenced the decision to drive uh, a single occupancy vehicle. Students instead indicated that the distance from their home address and the duration of their commute were major factors in their choice to drive a single occupancy vehicle. Among Loyola commuters, uh, the most popular factors that would increase carpooling at Loyola would be the integration of a comprehensive carpooling system for students, followed by reduced parking fees for carpooling vehicles. At the downtown campus, the most important factor would be reduced parking fees, followed by preferred parking uh, for carpooling vehicles. 
factors uh, for encouraging electric hybrid vehicle use would be dedicated parking for um, hybrid and electric vehicles on both campuses and also discounted parking. So looking at um, the emissions from commuting, uh, the following chart demonstrates emissions per campus and population subgroup within the survey results. It is important to see from the chart that staff and faculty from the downtown campus accrued the highest percentage of greenhouse gas emissions during their total annual commute to campus. Despite the significant difference in the population sizes at Concordia, emissions from downtown staff and faculty and students are really quite similar. There's only a 1% um, difference in the annual greenhouse gas emissions between the groups. The Loyola staff and faculty emit two times as much as the students from the same campus, despite being a much smaller subpopulation. So as the campus populations are different in size, it's uh, helpful to consider average emissions per person rather than the overall campus emissions. So students at the downtown campus are associated with the smallest proportion of emissions per person at 0.21 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per person compared to students at the Lyola campus who on average emit 0.4 kilograms uh, per person. And then staff and faculty at Lyola campus contribute um, the highest emissions overall at 1.05 kilograms per person. And staff and faculty at the downtown campus on average emit 0 0.28 uh, kilograms. Uh, also based on the estimates from the survey sample, the total annual commuting uh, emissions from the entire Concordia University population is approximately 15,893 megatons of CO2. Um, so this represents just over half of the total emissions from the Concordia University 2018-2019 academic year. So it's really quite significant. Um, so looking at um, how to support a modal shift for those single occupancy vehicles, um, respondents with the highest level of greenhouse gas emissions belong to the single occupant automobile category. And the following maps depict home addresses of respondents who indicated that they're uh, that they primarily used um, motorized vehicles to commute to campus in the spring and the fall. And um, the map also depicts the home addresses situated within a theoretical um, active transportation zone. So the active transportation zones were determined on the travel time data provided by respondents who are already engaged in some form of regular active transportation to campus. And each zone represents an area in Montreal accessible by walking and running um, or cycling for each Concordia campus within the timeframes um, listed in the legend. Both maps depict a number of Concordia staff and faculty and students who commute to their primary Concordia campus by motorized vehicle, despite living within areas accessible within these walking or cycling ranges indicated. Of this population, many respondents indicated that their main concerns with cycling were due to safety, um, indicating that this needs to be a primary avenue for Concordia to explore uh, solutions for. For future projects related to transportation, this is information from Concordia's mobility partners who our facilities management strategic planning team met with in relation to Concordia's newest campus master plan. Um, so for the STM, there's an intermodal integration project between the train, the metro, the REM, and the bus through the ARTM fare redesign and all accessible with the STM fares and with the same Opus card on its territory, Zone A. And this will um, significantly lower the price of train tickets on the island of Montreal. So this can have a positive influence on the inter-campus connectivity. And right now the time horizon for phase two is in July, 2022. The STM will also start electrifying its buses from 2025. Um, so if the technology permits, um, they're going to start only buying electric buses um, as of 2025, whereas in the past they've bought mostly hybrid buses. So this is, will have um, a positive impact on the guy street noise as well. For EXO, uh, the Montreal West Station Rehabilitation Project is um, currently happening. So the project involves constructing a new entrance to the station on the north side of the railway on Sherbrooke Street West, uh, which will allow for easier access um, from the Concordia Loyola campus. And the building project is part of a series of interventions on um, the station site to improve user safety and reduce conflicts between the train cars and pedestrians. 
EXO is also working on a redesign of its bus routes and Concordia is being consulted as a stakeholder. Um, lastly, looking at Bixie. Um, so as previously mentioned, the Bixie and uh, Mizanov and Mackay station is um, the most widely used Bixie station. Um, and Bixie also wants to expand um, its offer of Bixie stations on both campuses and they're wanting more off street space to facilitate their operations. Bixie's goal um, is to electrify its entire network and provide uh, year round service as well. Another change uh, that we can anticipate is that Concordia University will be able to estimate greenhouse gas emissions from business and research travel. And this is something um, we've never done before uh, because we didn't have the necessary data to do so. Uh, so figuring out our collective carbon footprint from business and research travel is really a crucial part of Concordia's climate action plan. Perfect. Well, on that note, Jess, thank you for that. That was so much information to digest. And it's incredible because people at Concordia are taking all of that information about our commuters into account when they're doing the master plan and other important strategic initiatives that are going to improve services. Um, so that's part of why we wanted to talk to everyone today about what they prefer as well. Um, but on the note of being able to measure our emissions from business travel, we will turn now to the next portion of the event and hear from Sebastian Kakar and Joseph Nevins, and they'll introduce us to the Fly Less movement, which seeks to reduce the carbon footprint of academia. Uh, so Sebastian, I'm going to stop my screen share here so that you can share your presentation. All right, Cassandra uh, and Jessica, thank you very much uh, for this uh, extensive presentation. And it's great to see that former students from our department, uh, Geography, Planning and Environment, are doing uh, a lot of uh, interesting things related to environmental issue and mobility at Concordia. Um, Joe Nevins will uh, start the presentation and then I will follow. Um, Joe Nevins is a professor at Vassar University and is one of the main leader of the flying less uh, at least in North America and probably worldwide. And I'm very happy uh, and proud to have him here for us to present just like very briefly, what is this idea of Flying Less Academia? And then after that, I will present um, what we've done uh, at Concordia and see and what, what we can do better. So Joe, if you want to go, are you ready? Everything is under control? Yes, can you hear me? Very well. Okay, very good. I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay. People can see that? Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, well, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and let me first thank Cassandra Lamontagne and the Office of Sustainability for organizing this. And of course, uh, thanks to my good friend, Sebastian Kaká for inviting me to participate. So as Sebastian, uh, Sebastian mentioned, I work with Flying Let's, uh, which is many things. It's an online petition. It's a blog. It's a resource on aviation and organizing, and it's an online venue for people to come together to work on markedly reducing academic flight. If you'd like to learn more about it, you can uh, go to that website that's listed on this slide. Uh, now, as I only have about 10 minutes, let me jump right into things. Okay. What I wanna do today is uh, threefold. First, I'm gonna talk about how flying compares to other modes of transport and trends in flying over time. Second, I'm gonna talk about the ecological footprint of flying, think about it globally as well as personally. And then three, I'm gonna briefly look at how flying relates to inequality, injustice, and violence. Now, let me preface this by reminding us of the challenge that humanity faces. We need to eliminate fossil fuel emissions within the next two decades or so. This is an enormous challenge. In other words, we need to radically cut our consumption and begin to do so immediately. My position is, is that this is a charge that's not consistent with the continuation of the jet setting ways that characterize much of academia. Right. So let me get into the, the first point about how flying compares to other modes of transport. Okay, what we find is that um, flying is generally speaking the least efficient way to travel in terms of CO2 emissions. Right? Uh, a short haul flight right, or a domestic flight right, typically emits, um, you know, th this is, this is um, 
looking at per per um, emissions per passenger per kilometer traveled, right? And what you're seeing on the flying ones, you're seeing a, a dark blue bar and a light blue one. And this speaks to the non-CO2 effects of flying. There are other gases that flying emits. And so that increases the climate, the radiative forcing of flying. So there are the CO2 effects and then the non-CO2 effects that one needs to consider, right? And generally speaking, flying outweighs all other forms of transportation by a significant uh, degree. I'm happy to share these slides with you if you'd like afterwards. All right, in terms of uh, long-term trends in flying, right, for those of us in the over 50 crowd, and I'm, I'm a member of that crowd, right, we know that flying has increased tremendously uh, in our lifetimes. Right. And this graph is one indication of this. This comes from the International Civil Aviation Organization, which is a UN agency that is sort of promotes flying. And if we look at flying over the last decade, we see that it can, has continued to grow. So before I go there, oops, sorry. Now, some might point out that flying has gotten a lot more efficient over the last several decades, right? And of course, this is true. Um, there's better aircraft design, there are lighter aircraft. Now, all of these have come together to significantly lower the per passenger and per kilometer emissions associated with flying. But the growth in flying has uh, significantly outweighed these improvements. And so while the at the same time, while there's talk of electric aircraft and other technological solution, electric aircraft at this point are, remote, uh, are not even remotely scalable. Not least because it would require an, um, an enormous, well, would require enormous and extremely heavy batteries uh, to be in planes. As for other technological breakthroughs, they are at this point just a dream. And this is what makes um, current trends and what people are suggesting are future trends all the more worrisome, right? Given current trends in flying, this is what is expected to be the amount of emissions from uh, flying within the next few decades. You note that there'll be significant growth, not surprisingly, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, but notably also in already in regions that already fly um, to the greatest degree. Uh, specifically North America. And North America here is meaning only Canada and the United States, it's not including Mexico. Sorry, give me a second. I should be good at Zoom by now, but you know, I'm not. Um, all right, let me go to the next term thing in terms of the ecological footprint of flying. Now critics of flying less efforts often point out that flying only makes up somewhere between 2.5 and 3% of global carbon emissions. They'll go so far as to argue that flying's uh, contribution to global emissions is minuscule. One of the per people who have responded to this very forcefully is Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson is a leading climate scientist. He was, uh, until fairly recently, the director of the Tyndale Center for Climate Change uh, out of the University of Manchester in Britain. And here's what he said. He said, I'm quoting him here, Similar arguments are made on behalf of specific industries and equally apply to Germany, California, Shanghai, or Beijing, all of which are also just a few percent of global emissions. Divide the world into a sufficient number of small parts and everything becomes so small as to be minuscule. Now, sticking with that two to 3%, right, we need to remind ourselves that if flying were a country it would be the equivalent of the sixth biggest country in the world in terms of its carbon emissions. Now, if every single person in the world were to fly one long haul trip, and a long haul trip is greater than 1500 kilometers, right, that would make flying the second biggest country in the world, right, between China and the United States in terms of climate emissions. Okay, now going to the individual level, one person who has explored this extensively is Peter Kalmus. He's a climate scientist for NASA, uh, as well as the California Institute of Technology. And out of his efforts has grown this book, Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. And as part of the research on this, he examined his own footprint in 2010. And he was shocked to find out that air travel accounted for more than two thirds of his emissions. All right, so he set out to radically cut his and his family's carbon emissions. 
And the way they did so most significantly was by eliminating flying, right? So by 2013, they had gotten to a zero level and now he and his family are below the global mean for CO2 emissions. Finally, the last point, how flying relates to inequality, injustice, and violence. The first thing to note is that personal consumption and by ex extension, CO2 emissions is highly unequal across the globe. As this image from Oxfam shows, about 10% of the world's population is responsible for is responsible for about half of all CO2 emissions. Conversely, about um, the the bottom 10% of the world in terms of wealth, and the poorest 50%, excuse me, the bottom the poorest 50% of the world's population is responsible for only 10% of global carbon emissions. Right now, you might ask, who's in this 10%? This top 10%? Well, in the old days, the way they could tell who's in the top 10% is who owned a television, right? Well, televisions have become very democratized, and then it moved to cars or automobiles. Right? Again, they've become much more democratized. Now, flying is the biggest indicator of who is in the top 10%. If, you're in the, if you fly, you can be pretty sure you're in this top decile. Okay. Of course, this unfolds, or for, well, first of all, let me say in terms of who flies. Okay. Well, in the United Kingdom, 15% of the country's population is responsible for about 70% of the emissions associated with indi individual flights. In the United States, 12% of the population is responsible for about two thirds of the country's passenger air travel. Right? In any given year, a little less than half of the US population will get on a plane, but 12, about 12% 12 are responsible for two thirds of the emissions. My guess is that the situation in Canada is very similar to what we see in the United Kingdom, in the United States, but I haven't seen any study on that, but I'm pretty confident in assuming that. Right, now, let's, um, um, now let's look at it worldwide. Right? In 2018, at most 1% of the world's population accounted for more than half of the total emissions from pass passenger air travel. Right? And that same year, only 11% of the people in the world traveled by air, with at most 4% doing so internationally. This speaks to how flying is an elite activity. Of course, at most universities in North America, it's a normal activity as well. About 80% of the world's population has never flown, right? Which is really unthinkable at a place like my institution where it's, it's really hard to find someone who has never been on a plane. Okay, now let's, compare this to, uh, let's think about this in terms of emissions per capita in terms of on the international scale, because of course all this is unfolding in a world of great inequality. If we compare uh, per capita emissions from the United States with those of Mexico, which is about a little more than three metric tons, the United States is about 16 metric tons. Of course, you know, um, we, can, we can talk about some of the problems with these measurements, but th this indicates the inequality. Uh, Whereas in uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, right, per capita emissions are about one metric ton, one sixteenth of what we see in the United States. If we compare that to academia, right, it gets even more interesting. A, f uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a, an article put out from some scholars at the University of Montreal. Right, they um, they estimate that the typical academic at the University of Montreal. Right, expends over 10 metric tons in carbon emissions through flying. Uh, Sebastian and some colleagues a couple of years ago at the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment at Concordia estimated their department, each person was a little over two metric tons. Right? If we compare that to the AAG meeting, the AAG is the Association of American, no, American Association of Geographers. I should know this since I'm a member. Um, just participation at one meeting, a meeting in Seattle in 2011, excuse me, let me go back to that. Right, it was almost one metric ton per person attending the meeting. Uh, Peter Kalmus's flights in 2013, excuse me, in 2010 was almost 13, was over 13 metric tons. And again, let's compare this to El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras, right? Per person for all activities over a year, about one metric ton. Again, this is a great manifestation of the inequalities that flying embodies. 
Now, one person that's tried to visualize this is Richard Pankert. Richard is a, uh, an academic at the University of Graz in Austria. And he's trying to think about what this means in terms of how people live and die across the planet. And according to his measurements, right, roughly every 1,000 tons of carbon, right, which generates 3,700 3, tons of CO2, one future premature death is caused. Let's put, think about that in terms of academic gatherings. So looking at the AAG meeting in Seattle in 2014, right, it means that the meeting resulted in 1.5 premature deaths. In terms of the American Geophysical Union, which is a huge meeting, right? I think about 28,000 people attend that in San Francisco. Um, that resulted in 18.6 premature deaths, according to Pankat's calculations. Now, of course, these deaths and other harms don't unfold unevenly across space and society, but flow from and reproduce various inequities. Right? And this is one reason why Black Lives Matter UK closed down London City Airport a few years ago. Right? It's why they say that the climate crisis is a racist crisis. This crisis, of course, is also one of class, gender, empire, and other expressions of unjust hierarchy of profoundly unequal life and death circumstances. It's for such reasons that flying less is not simply about individual choice or climate change in a narrow sense. It's about a much larger questions. And these are the questions that we of course have to grapple with. So let me stop there. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph, for that. That was extremely enlightening and pretty uh, harrowing at the same time. Uh, Sebastian, I think you also had a presentation you wanted to share on Flying Less Concordia. Yeah, so I'm gonna follow up and I'm gonna basically show our uh, website. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Joe, for just uh, setting the, the discussion and the presentation. So do you see my, uh, my screen, my, my web? Uh, my brother? Okay, great. So um, following everything that uh, Joe said and other things that happened in 2019, early 2019, at the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment at Concordia, we started a climate emergency group. And uh, it was uh, started by my colleague, uh, Johan Jager. And part of my contribution was to uh, promote and to develop the flying less uh, movement here at Concordia, starting with our department. So uh, we uh, started by collecting um, different things and then um, having some kind of a policy that was accepted a few months later by the entire department here. So uh, why flying less? I think uh, Joe explained that very clearly. And so we developed this flying less policy based on all these different arguments. And our idea was, okay, we need to, uh, set the tone, and here's the quote that I really like, researchers are the source of the increasing number of warnings about the states of our climate and biodiversity, and their credibility would be damaged by not setting an example. Like we cannot keep on saying there's an issue with climate and not doing anything on our own. And that was really the idea behind this movement, like what can we do that is not as simple as uh, signing a petition and that can have an impact on, on um, the, the climate. So uh, the overall goal of this policy, as we see on, on this website, is to encourage a low carbon working culture by valuing the health and productivity benefit that can be gained by reducing travel, supporting each other in making conscious travel decision and working towards sensitiz sensitizing others to the needs of the research community to work the talk on climate change. And we also understand that there are some different people at different moments in their career and some people who need to travel to do field, field work or all kinds of good reasons for doing uh, traveling, flying. But there are also many other moments where this could be avoided. And this is the one that we're trying to, to target to this, um, to this policy. So we have a, a full policy here that is available on our website. Uh, there is like a, like a brief introduction. It was uh, unanimously accepted on June 1st, 2019. And then some commitments. So here are the, what we committed to do about two and a half years ago, disclosing our annual flying activity, 
so beautiful time a member of the department is supposed to disclose the uh, flying activity and uh, my colleagues have done very well in that sense. They've been very supportive. Like every year, we're a 20 full-time faculty member, and we always have a couple of people on um, on sabbatical. But we always get 18 or 19 uh, answer every year for that for that survey, which is quite impressive uh, because it asks for the legs, so it's it's it could be a, a bit long. So priority is uh, prioritizing trouble-free meetings through video conferencing. Furthermore, that now we can do that way more easily than we were able to do in two and a half years ago. Uh, it was pre-COVID, so it was a completely different world in terms of uh, conferencing. Uh, priorities, uh, prioritizing collective ground travel, extended stays instead of very quick uh, trip, declining to participate in academic activity that involved long-term, long-distance travel for low academic benefit. And this is sometimes an, an, like a not easy one because uh, you can sometimes you're invited to uh, some event that you really feel that you'd like to go, but the academic benefit is not that great. And so we try to encourage people to, uh, to decline those invitations. And then promoting a flying less uh, policy. And this is where the, uh, the Office of Sustainability could be great uh, because this is what we're trying to do at Concordia. And thank you for inviting us to talk about that here, uh, Cassandra, in that aspect. And then trying to support uh, students to found some uh, academic activity that may not require flying. Also, we know sometimes it does, but like trying to support as much as possible alternative way of traveling to meet other students or uh, peers or, or professor going to conferences. So uh, if we go back to uh, here, we, in terms of the data we collected, so uh, between June 2018 and May 2019, for our 20 members, full, uh, part, uh, the full-time faculty members of our department, because this is our target, right? We want to see like us who are most responsible uh, for uh, these uh, carbon emissions, like how much do we, do we do? So it was our baseline in 2018-19. So we flew about three, uh, 350,000 kilometers total for 50 people for a total assessed of uh, 50 tons of CO2. So 2.6 as uh, uh, Joe was mentioning. A year later, uh, there was quite a reduction. We moved from 300, 355 to uh, 136 kilometers flying with uh, average uh, CO2 emission of 0 0.95. And so if we look at that and ask people why they, like well, we had a couple of questions they were supposed to answer. So we moved from 52 tons in 2018-19 to, 20, uh, to 19 tons in 19 uh, 20. Part of it was this, the COVID because it started in March. So everything was shut down between March and end of May. And then after, of course. So we estimated that we uh, saved 11 tons of carbon, but also part of it was uh, the policy. And uh, our colleagues said that uh, they didn't do that fly because of the policy um, or the, that may have influenced their choice. So there was like a quite a, bit, uh, a big reduction. Now, I have a poll for you, but it's not prepared. I just want to ask you, uh, what do you think is the value for 2020, 2021? No ideas? Ta-da, zero. So we didn't fly. Well, there is a good reason for that, of course but still we're very proud to now being at zero. So last year, collectively, none of us for professional purposes had travel with flying. Okay, so we are there. We'll see how it changed over time, but now our baseline is uh, zero uh, emissions. So uh, what we also want to do is to encourage people to pledge to reduce their flying activity. And this is the goal of this uh, website. Uh, so we have encouraging uh, faculty members and staff to pledge to sign and to say that they will be, uh, they agree uh, that name is possible and they will reduce uh, systematically over time their, uh, their flying activity. So at the moment we have uh, 28 members of uh, faculty members across the university. It's a start. Uh, we have students supporting us as well. So we didn't want to put the burden on students. We really want to take it on our own, but we also really appreciate the support of students. Same at the moment, we have 28 students that have uh, supported this, uh, this policy, a lot of from the geography department. 
uh, and we thank them at the same time. So, but it's open for anyone at Concordia, either a student or faculty member, to pledge and support. And we really want to bring it to the to the next level. I'm just gonna conclude here by uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, this website uh, has been developed by uh, Luz Gomez Valerio, who was a master student in our program, the, our master of environmental uh, assessment, and she did her internship with um, a uh, net impact uh, group. And so she was focusing on this and trying to develop this website and collecting all kinds of information uh, on those uh, on those issues. And uh, last thing is that there are many similar activities. Uh, of course, uh, Joe is here among the, the people that are very influential in this in this world, but there are also other uh, universities that are taking um, more radical steps toward cutting a lot of them in, in, in Europe, but also UBC are cutting their, uh, their fine emission uh, among faculty members. That's it for me. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, to clarify very quickly before we go into more substantial questions, um, would you say that staff could also take this pledge? Because I know it's very faculty focused for research travel, but if we do have staff members uh, who are curious about whether they can sort of reduce any business travel that they might be taking, uh, is that something that you invite as well? And full disclosure, I also signed the pledge, even though I'm not a faculty member. <laughs> We, we yeah of course we do encourage everyone to support us i mean it's like the idea is it's we try to avoid like we we don't want to put the burden on other groups so we take it on us like but any support is just welcome and any person who think twice before flying uh i think it's uh it, it's one step in the right direction yeah absolutely um so i'll Anyone watching right now, uh, please, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask questions to Sebastien and to Joseph about uh, you know, the, the load of flying on our environment as well as flying less Concordia, please do. You can also put your question in the chat. Um, I will ask a question that I, that, you know, I have about this, which is the, the, the question is how impactful these movements actually are. And, people often say that plane is gonna be taking off whether I'm on it or not. So will it make a big difference if I reduce? Um, and there was kind of similar questions about divestment for a really long time in, in the university and in other institutional contexts where people were starting to uh, question, what is the real impact? Is it a symbolic impact or is it that by taking my funds or my very limited funds in the case of a university out of uh, the fossil fuel industry, there will be a, a tangible reduction in emissions because of that. And so it's, it's an interesting, um, I think, uh, question that a lot of people have about what the true impact is. And I wonder if you could speak to that um, and about also whether you think the fly less movement could become as influential as the divest movement over time. Sebastian, do you want to take it? I can start and then you can uh, join me. Uh, the, the, for the fly, uh, I can talk about the, 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 the fly. Uh, no, the, the fly will not take off if there are not enough people in it. They will not, they will take, put one less flight and one less plane. So like they don't fly uh, plane without any people. So if people don't uh, uh, buy tickets, then there's less, there's less flight. So yes, of course, if one person is missing the flight, it will take off. But if we don't buy the ticket, there won't be less uh, planes. So that could be the part of the first. Do you want to take the bigger uh, question on the divest, uh, Joe? I mean, that, that's, a, that, that's a question of, about the future, which I always like to think about, uh, you know, what are the possibilities? I mean, sure, it could it be? Absolutely. Will it be? That, that, that really depends on what we all do. And let me just say, you know, going back to the question that, that Sebastian uh, addressed, I mean, the, the goal is not just to get Sebastien to stop flying. <laughs> the goal is to get many people, right, to denormalize, right, to, to significantly rein in flying, mm -hmm. right, because of its huge carbon footprint. And if individuals aren't willing to change, right, we, we can't make that, that, that social leap, right? Planes are not in the business of, of flying empty. I mean, air, airlines are not in the business of flying empty aircraft. We know that flights are added and subtracted all the time on the basis of demand. Right. But without this example setting, 
that you know uh, the Department of Geography, Planning, and Environment at Concordia is engaged in, among other institutions and places, um, we have no hope um, in, in reducing flying. Right, so it's absolutely it's absolutely um, imperative that individuals be willing to do so. And the very fact that we're having this conversation, that Sebastian in his presentation can point to all these universities that are engaged in these conversations and efforts speaks to the importance of um, individual choice. And individual choice, of course, is always situated in a larger context. So it's never individual, right? And the individual and the collective are always in dialogue with one another. So if there were a critical mass of, of universities and individuals who are all taking this concerted action, there would be a real impact on the number of flights uh, that are airborne. That's right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not seeing any, and correct me if I'm wrong, Anna or any of the others, if there's uh, questions in the chat or hands up. If there aren't, we will probably uh, move on to our next uh, section of the event. Okay. Well, I just really wanna thank you both, Sebastien and Joseph. I feel like you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, the justice, I think, component of this question is also a really crucial one that we need to keep exploring. And it's been really interesting to hear you both talk about it. Um, so thank you very much. And I hope that our participants learned a lot about this topic from you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. and thank you, Joe. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, folks. So rather than going back to screen sharing, which uh, I had a really hard time doing while also putting comments into the chat and links into the chat for you, which is why they all came together really belatedly. Uh, we're just gonna move on to the part of this event where we ask for your feedback on sustainable transport and on transport services at Concordia and on what you really would like to see change in the future or in the near future and what you'd like to see improve. So we were thinking for the first uh, 15 minutes or so, we would allow you time also for a little break. It's been already an hour of this event. We want you to have a little health break uh, if you need one, but we're right now gonna put some links in the chat that you can follow during the next 15 minutes, take your break, but then come back and start writing your comments into the Klaxoon, which is the platform that we're using for this. So I'll be putting the, um, the link in and you can choose among the different uh, topic boards that we've set up. Um, you'll be asked to input uh, an access code when you go to that link there. And this, uh, oh, sorry, let me clarify what these, what these are. The boards uh, are on the topics of cycling, public transit, inter-campus travel, such as the shuttle or other ways that we get between campuses and uh, cars. So I'm putting in these individual access codes and you can copy paste those into the link that I shared. Apparently I'm sharing that to everyone in waiting room. <laughs> so let me share that to everyone who's actually here. Everyone in meeting, sorry about that. So go ahead and uh, go to that link there and then you can just basically use little post-its and um, put your thoughts in on some of the prompt questions we have available there for you. Or just in the general section, you can add your thoughts to that. And then when we come back, we're gonna be doing more of a breakout room exercise. So please uh, take some time uh, for the next 14 minutes, I guess uh, we can rejoin here at um, 117 and then we'll be doing breakout rooms. All right. So welcome back everyone. Uh, I hope you had a good break and uh, don't worry about the collect soon. If you weren't able to get to it, we're gonna be sending it around actually to all the registrants who weren't able to make it today so that we can actually continue collecting that feedback over the week. Um, so what we'd like to do now is for the people who are still here and congratulations for still being here and you're gonna be entered into a draw for a Dixie pass, so way to go. Uh, if you're able to either unmute and or come onto camera, we can do more of a group convo 
rather than breakout rooms, because anyone who has rudimentary math skills know that we don't have enough people for breakout rooms. So uh, yeah, we invite you to, to come on and just what we'd love from you is your thoughts on transport, getting to Concordia, the most annoying parts of your commute, uh, any ideas you have for how things could be amazing or better. You know, there are things floating around like buses with Wi-Fi or bus shelters that have screens or ways to charge your phone while on transit. So lots of cool things might come out of this discussion eventually. Um, so I, I see you in the, in the participant list. We have someone named Angelica. We have a Jan, a Sarah, and uh, I think everyone else is part of the, the event. And otherwise, we'll just give a, a quick thank you to everyone who's involved in wrap up early, but I'll give a minute to see if anyone wants to come on and chat. Perhaps everyone's already gone back to work and just forgot to leave the Zoom meeting, which is fine. All right. So in that case, uh, just what do you say? Should we wrap it up? I think so. Sure. Okay. So thank you guys so much for being here. We'll we'll pass it over to Anna to close this off properly. Um, we appreciate uh, you know, the attention to this really important topic and we're gonna continue the dialogue. We'll be getting back in touch with everyone who registered to continue the conversation and keep getting your input on uh, commuting to Concordia and on sustainable transport. So uh, I guess that would be over to the fourth space if we've got someone ready <laughs> and available to, to end this lovely event. Hi, I'll, I'll just pop in here. Um, oh, good. <laughs> I, I put a comment in, in the public transit uh, board. Um, yes. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I was one of those people who was working at the same time and had it on. And I was like, oh, we're back. Okay. Um, but yeah, my question is, is really, it's, it's like a very direct question. It's around the Opus Plus uh, Enterprise membership. So I'm I'm one of those people that left the island <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, and I was actually surprised, you know, I was like, okay, I have to get an Opus card, fine. And I was surprised that Concordia didn't have, um, or wasn't part of the, the like enterprise membership thing. Um, is that something that is a possibility? Uh, so the enterprise membership, we have looked into that. And the problem with it is that it tends to be for uh, smaller companies with fewer employees. Okay. Uh, and in order for us to give a good rate uh, for each of our members, it would be a pretty uh, astronomical cost for the university with a small, small discount, relatively speaking, for each individual. It's not off the board. It's not out of the question. But what they're doing instead is to take part into these uh, discussions with ARTM and with the STM about redistributing the transit fare pass to make it a lot easier for people who have to take the train in on the island and they're sort of advocating uh, for Concordians who who need to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know just about the timeline for the reduced fare pass if we have one. I think it was 2022. Okay so apparently this is an issue not just for for us and we're hoping that there's going to be a really advantageous uh, new distribution of how those rates are calculated for people off island. Okay. And then if it's still really, if it's still really undoable and unaffordable, then we can turn back to the enterprise uh, solution. All right. Thanks for the information. Yeah. And thanks for that question, Sarah. I'd like to thank Cassandra and uh, uh, Jessica who are here in the space with us downtown for those of you who are uh, downtown at any time in the coming days and weeks, we do invite you to stop in to Four Space and visit us, come in to witness, take part in uh, these kind of live events happening, whether in this hybrid format um, or fully in the space. 
So please do check out our website, concordia.ca slash four to get all the info of what's upcoming on the daily. And once again, I'd like to thank the Office of Sustainability reps who are here with us today, as well as those who joined us via Zoom as audience members and presenters for taking part in this event. We are going to post the recording of it on our YouTube channel. So I'll send a link to that uh, um, to all those who registered for the event. And of course, we did live stream to Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, check out CU Fourth Space to access that stream now. All right, folks, on that note, we're going to close up the meeting. Thanks so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again next time and have a great afternoon. Bye.